This will be a shorter essay, one that intends to analyze a five-year-old Kurzgesagt video. The video in question deals with nihilism, and as usual, it is well edited and narrated. But the most important part is that it communicates in an eloquent manner the life philosophy of my generation. I will cover the thesis of this video and why it makes my generation miserable. The video starts talking about how humans evolved and how we became conscious and saw a world that naturally complemented us. And we concluded that this world was made for us by some deity. Then we discovered the universe and realized that it was immense, so big in relation to us that we were insignificant to it, and that the universe is far older than our own existence. Therefore, it could not have been created for us that we were just here without a purpose. We just are. Although Kurzgesagt is not explicitly atheistic, this video is very much a perfect example of how to slip the message indirectly. It tells you that some people believe in a deity as the first primitive humans did, but then they state the facts about us being insignificant. Furthermore, in a cosmic scale, your life will not even be noticed, and we are all going to die. This is compounded when they mention that some people believe in a soul, but we have not been able to scientifically prove it. So when our limited amount of time runs out, we will be gone forever. So far into the video, I cannot disagree with it. My first existential crisis came from the feeling of being a speck of dust compared to the universe, combined with the fact that one day I will die without a heaven to go to. And I think that everyone can relate to at least one of these fears. This is when nihilism sets in, when we realize that in the end, what we do in our lives won't really matter. But of course, nihilism is a really shitty life philosophy if you want to live a good life. When everything is meaningless and nothing matters, then our lives are equally insignificant and this will lead us to lives that are not as good as they could have been if we had a clear life purpose. The only people that can escape this crisis are the people who have enough faith to take Kierkegaard's leap and believe unconditionally in God. These true believers are rare in our age and every day there are fewer of them. And sadly for me, I cannot bring myself to believe. Then it is nihilism for me. So this is the dilemma of modern times. We who do not believe face a list of existential questions. Where do we derive meaning in our lives? What is my purpose? What should I aim for in my life? If we fail to answer these questions in a satisfactory way, we will enter into an existential crisis. And our dear friends in Kurzgesagt also realize this, and they call their answer optimistic nihilism. We counter existential dread with optimistic nihilism. What do we mean by that? Well, to summarize, it seems very unlikely that 200 trillion trillion stars have been made for us. In a way, it feels like the cruelest joke in existence has been played on us. We became self-aware only to realize this story is not about us. While it is great to know about electrons and the powerhouse of the cell, science doesn't do a lot to make this less depressing. Okay, but so what? You only get one shot at life, which is scary, but it also sets you free. If the universe ends in heat death, every humiliation you suffer in your life will be forgotten. Every mistake you made will not matter in the end. Every bad thing you did will be voided. If our life is all we get to experience, then it's the only thing that matters. If the universe has no principles, the only principles relevant are the ones we decide on. If the universe has no purpose, then we get to dictate what its purpose is. Humans will most certainly cease to exist at some point. But before we do, we get to explore ourselves and the world around us. We get to experience feelings. We get to experience food, books, sunrises, and being with each other. There are billions of stars to visit, diseases to cure, people to help, happy feelings to be experienced, and video games to finish. There is so much to do. So wrapping up, you've probably used up a good chunk of the time available to you. 
If this is our one shot at life, there is no reason not to have fun and live as happily as possible. Bonus points if you make the life of other people better. More bonus points if you help build a galactic human empire. Do the things that make you feel good. You get to decide whatever this means for you. To summarize their argument, since the universe is only made out of matter and we will one day be forever gone, then there is no inherent meaning to life. Because there is no inherent meaning, the only meaning of life is the meaning that we decide to give it. You are free to live according to the principles that make you feel good. The reason that I think that this specific Kurzgesagt video is so important is that it is factually correct. There isn't a single fact or argument in this video that I think is incorrect. However, I still think that their conclusion is fucking terrible. The fact is, is that that is the prevalent philosophy of my generation. Although most people cannot express it as eloquently as our friends in Kurzgesagt, the argument is the same. First, I don't believe in God or an afterlife. People who believe half-heartedly are also included in this. Second, all is subjective, therefore I can do whatever I want. Third, I will follow my passions and experience as much pleasure as I can. And this somehow gets you to happiness. I believe that this way of thinking is the reason that so many people are miserable in the modern world. I talk from experience because this is the life philosophy that I see around me, the one that most of my friends live by and the one that I lived for many years. The freedom to choose meaning in their lives means that most people will likely choose a lifestyle focused on chasing pleasure with the assumption that if they get enough pleasure in their lives, they will be happy. Some play video games, some watch TV shows or sports, and others spend their time in social media. All of these are great at giving us huge amounts of pleasure. We experience much more pleasure than in any other age before us. But still, I see that despite this huge amount of stimulation and fun, my generation is really not happy. The biggest sign of this is not the incredible amount of pills that the average person takes, nor the rising prevalence of loneliness and depression. No, it is instead the amount of addiction that I see around me. The person that is most vulnerable to addiction is a person that is unhappy or unfulfilled, and is looking to escape his torment with the help of something external. These people are nomads, they are trying to escape from their unhappiness and this means that they cannot stay still. Instead, this sort of person lives in a rush, moving from pleasure to pleasure in a desperate attempt to escape their problems. Of course, there are the typical addictions around drugs, and indeed drug consumption has been going up across society as well as deaths by overdose. But the most common addiction is not to substance, but to entertainment. The average person that spends his life scrolling or gaming does not live like this because they are enjoying their time. Instead, it is because they are using their phones and games to escape their realities. But you can witness the same desperation in many other things. Some people try to escape from their problems by focusing on their careers and working insane amounts of time. Some of them are indeed very successful, but the fact remains that they cannot stand still. Because if they are not distracted, they are alone with their thoughts, and they will have to face their problems. This desperation to escape is the infallible way to spot unhappiness. Most unhappy people can convince themselves that they are happy. But the truth always comes out when they are lying in their beds at 3 a.m. trying to sleep with a conscience that refuses to do so. This, of course, is a generalization. Most people are not consumed by their desperation to escape reality. But doesn't it ring partly true in your life? Do you not sometimes feel the desire to switch your thoughts off? To be in another world that is more interesting than this one? At least I believe that most people are not as happy as they would like to believe they are. This has a very good reason. 
But first, we have to define what happiness is. Happiness is to have more pleasure than pain in your life. It's all about having a positive balance. But the great problem is that having a positive balance is very difficult because of the fact that in life, suffering heavily outweighs pleasure. Compare the pleasure and pain of two animals, one that is eating the other. One gets a bit of pleasure from eating something tasty, while the other one is experiencing the agony of being ripped apart. Or look at the things that we need to be content. We need to have all of our needs met. We need food, sleep, water, warmth, human contact, etc. But in order to torture someone, all that you have to do is to take one of these away. Happiness is harder to achieve than misery in the same way that it is easier to knock down a house of cards than it is to build one. But the fact that we have a conscience just makes life more painful because we not only feel our own suffering, but that of others, especially that of our past selves in the form of regret and of our future selves in the form of fear. At least the animal can live in the present moment, but we are stuck with the suffering of our past, present and future. But we suffer most because we feel existential anxiety, while beings without a conscience do not worry about such things, nor have the capacity to contemplate their own death. The worst existential pain is a lack of meaning. As mentioned, we have one life, and the feeling that it will not matter causes a pain like no other. The other fact that makes happiness hard to achieve is boredom. Life is hard enough. But if we ever actually manage to resolve all of our problems and we finally have peace, we will be happy for a week before we fall prey to a crushing boredom that brings us right back to unhappiness. So the issue with achieving and retaining happiness is not the amount of pleasure that you have in your life. Instead, the most important consideration when it comes to trying to achieve happiness is to reduce our suffering. If you have normal amounts of suffering in your life and you don't have much pleasure, you will be unhappy. And if you have a lot of pleasure, you will quickly get used to it and you will be unhappy once again. Many of the simple and humble people of this world are able to achieve happiness with simple means while most millionaires don't even get close to being happy. Do you think that millionaires go on spending sprees on cars, clothes and mansions because they are happy? A happy person can enjoy a drink, but only an unhappy one cannot stop drinking. Here is where I find the biggest problem with the argument of our dear friends at Kurzgesagt. This is a very optimistic way to look at life, and there is a problem with it. That is that when you treat life like an adventure full of fun things to do, you set a very high expectation for your life. And expectations are a funny thing. You can turn any positive experience into disappointment by setting your expectations too high. And by taking this hyper-optimistic view of life, you also take a risk. If you expect to be very happy and reality does not live up to your expectations, you will feel massively disappointed. This optimism can only exist when you look at the positive side of life and ignore or escape the negative. This way of life will make you superficially happy because you will only see the positive side, but you will have to keep moving because if you linger, you will see that you're not as happy as you pretend to be. So millions of people fall into this psychological trap. They want to be happy so badly that they will ignore the things that make them miserable, but this does not help them. Instead, it makes it impossible to reduce the suffering in their life. Therefore, it will also make happiness impossible for them. The people who do not look at the positive and the negative parts of their lives will stay miserable with a thin veneer of happiness that is only able to fool others, resulting in a domino effect of people pretending to be happy. 
So how can one lessen the suffering in one's life? The most important thing to do is to face the things that hurt you, your fears, regrets, and experiences. There is also a trick with the things that make you suffer. They stop hurting when you accept them. This process of accepting something painful is what we call grieving. It hurts, it sucks, but it is the only way out of misery. But if you don't look at something, then it is impossible to accept it. This is exactly why I am writing this essay. The conclusion that you take from the Kurzgesagt video is to ignore the things that make you suffer because they will not matter in the end. Every mistake you made will not matter in the end. Which is sort of a huge cope. Instead, you should do the fun things that make you feel good. The reason that I decided to write this essay is that this video spreads this way of thinking that pushes its viewers into the trap of over-optimism and fake happiness. Looking at one's whole life is an important step towards happiness, but this still leaves us with the most important problem of the whole topic. If the universe has no inherent meaning, how can we give meaning to our lives? So first we have to ask, what is meaning or purpose and where does it come from? It all begins with the fact that we know that we are going to die. If I'm going to die, then the only thing that will be left is my legacy. My legacy is the impact that I had on the world. It can be the family that I created, the work that I dedicated my whole life to, or the effect that I had on other people's lives. If you are doing something that will leave a legacy, you will feel that this activity is meaningful. If you are doing something that will have no impact on the world, then this activity is meaningless. This feeling of having wasted a day in this finite life is truly crushing. It means that if I continue to live like this, when I die, I will be forgotten, and my life will have made no difference, that it would not matter if I was never born. In my experience, meaninglessness is such a painful feeling that it makes it impossible to have a positive pain-pleasure balance. As long as we have no meaning in our lives, we cannot be happy. The great dilemma is that just because something is pleasurable does not mean that it is meaningful. That is why we can have lives full of pleasure, money, luxury, sex, technology, and drugs, and we can still manage to be miserable. So this idea that we can reach happiness by doing a lot of fun things is complete bullshit. Happiness can only be achieved when we have some important task to do, something that will change the world despite of our death. And again, the Kurzgesagt video takes a step in the right direction by stating that we have to decide what gives meaning to our lives. But in order for some activity to give meaning, it has to have two things. First, the work that you are doing needs to be important to you. And second, you have to struggle for it. Without struggle, without personal sacrifice, we cannot feel fulfilled. Imagine a movie where the hero gets the girl and they live happily ever after without any effort, drama or conflict. That would be 90 boring minutes. Now imagine doing the same for 80 years. Schopenhauer, as usual, explains it perfectly. If the world were a paradise of luxury and ease, a land flowing with milk and honey, where every jack obtained his jill at once and without any difficulty, men would either die of boredom or hang themselves. So in order to live a meaningful experience, you have to find something that you care about and you have to fight for it. It is ironic that the only way to relieve us of the suffering of meaninglessness is to find something important to suffer for. The step out of nihilism is not 
an easy one, especially in our current times. But the great problem with optimistic nihilism is that it takes half a step in the right direction, but short of being useful. Instead, it leads the individual into the trap of fake happiness, where one lives without any real meaning. You have one life. Don't take optimistic nihilism as an excuse to waste your time in meaningless pleasures. These pleasures will promise happiness, but they will disappoint. Turn your nihilism into something heroic. Face the realities of your life and stop being a nomad that runs away from yourself. And then find something important, something difficult, and dedicate yourself completely to this cause. Don't bend. Don't wear it down. Don't try to make it logical. Don't edit your own soul according to the fashion. Rather, follow your most intense obsessions mercilessly. Once that you accept that you're going to die, then you should live in such a way that when you find yourself in your deathbed, you can say confidently that your life was not in vain. That is what overcoming nihilism means to me.